that we make a person uh, first of all realize what is his or her actual calling and if that is the drive which that person has then we must not uh, overburden uh, that student uh, with our expectations. Hello everyone. So today we have Dr. Manvendra Kumar Tiwari sir with us, who is Dean of Faculty at DNLU. Sir has uh, been awarded a PhD from Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia National Law University, Lucknow. Welcome you, sir. Thank you, Gaurik. So today's discussion will be on uh, legal opportunities and legal career opportunities as an overview. So let's get started with uh, judiciary as the very first point, sir. So, sir. Judiciary is an area that everyone once in a law life thinks of like pursuing a uh, judge's life and being a judge, like as being a judge, had I been in a judgment, what would I have been uh, delivering the judgment as? So have you ever come across this thought ever in your life to be a judge? Okay, thank you, Gauri. Uh, I personally never uh, was attracted to uh, judiciary as a career option, but for students of law, definitely, uh, judicial service uh, for high courts and supreme court we don't call it a judicial service but uh, to be a judge is an aspirational career choice uh, and uh, as the students would know that there are uh, in fact three entry levels for a student of law to get into judiciary one immediately after uh, their BALLB or LLB uh, they can write the judicial service examination and if successful, they are, uh, they are, they are in judicial service, uh, which unfortunately the Constitution of India calls subordinate judiciary. Uh, so they would, they would be part of the uh, lower judicial service. Uh, there is a second way to enter judicial service, so that is uh, after seven years of uh, uh, being a practitioner uh, at, at courts, be it uh, district court, high court or supreme court, and uh, if one is of 35 years of age, then they are eligible to write the higher judicial service examination. And uh, if uh, one is able to clear it, then uh, uh, the person directly gets appointed as an additional district and sessions judge. And uh, so this is the second way to enter uh, the Achaeans of uh, judicial service. And the third entry level is where you are directly from uh, a practitioner as a litigating lawyer you are directly appointed to High Court and sometimes even Supreme Court directly as a judge uh, by the Collegium of the Supreme Court, which has the responsibility under the present setup to appoint judges for the High Court and Supreme Court. Yes. So, sir, uh, further question from that only, that uh, what do you suggest the law students, like uh, giving lower judiciary or in CJI's words, uh, district judiciary, or rather than that, uh, practicing for 10 years, paving the way to High Court? Like, what do you prefer? I think uh, it is, after all, a uh, choice which uh, a law graduate has to exercise. And uh, if one is uh, interested in becoming a judge, then obviously even joining uh, lower judicial service is, is a very good career option. And India certainly at the lower judicial level also need good judges. So therefore, if one is attracted to judicial service uh, in particular, then joining judicial service immediately after graduating as a law student is also a very good career option. And uh, later, like becoming a High Court and Supreme Court judge, I don't think even the High Court and Supreme Court judges would generally aspire to become judges as they grow, uh, as they grow in the profession as, as a lawyer. Uh, they obviously become eligible to be appointed and once they are offered that position, they take it. But uh, th yes, those who, I, I do not see that those who aspire to, those who are in higher judicial service, so or say for example in High Court and Supreme Court, they would right from the beginning when they have started their career as a litigator, would think of becoming a judge. It happens as it happens, obviously one accepts it. Okay, so, so do you think that the life of a judicial officer is full of benefits? or it's just an oasis before you get to that position? I don't think calling it a benefit would be an appropriate word. Uh, yes, obviously you don't, uh, this, you are not going there to do a philanthropic uh, job. So obviously you would, you are, you are interested and you are, uh, the, the salary and the perk of a judicial officer 
is something that attracts you. Uh, <clears throat> so there, but but calling it a benefit, I don't think is appropriate. Uh, but then you don't join uh, because of those things. So because of uh, uh, because the primary motivation has to be that you can excel and you can do well in that profession and that is something that is uh, akin to uh, uh, your thought process. So if that is what attracts you, then I guess that is the, that's how a student should actually opt for uh, a career in judiciary and not because of the benefits associated. I think that's also, that is also a feudal probably way of uh, looking at it that you will have people at our disposal. I don't think that should be the motivation for a person to become a judge. Okay. And sir, do you think that uh, LLM from abroad or LLM in general matters when you aspire to become a judge? Okay. Uh, LLM is not a uh, an eligibility criteria right, for a person to become a judge. Even even the Chief Justice of India, you don't need to be LLM. So uh, I don't think LLM has got anything to do with uh, judicial service. But yes, uh, LLM is higher education. So those who are who possess the LLM degree, uh, they are expected to be a little more uh, grounded in uh, the theory and application of law. So obviously, if you are LLM. Uh, in all likelihood that must add to your skill and knowledge and correspondingly it will add to your competence as a judge but uh, in particular uh, llm uh, a judge with an llm degree uh, it's not per se there is there is no presupposition that you would be a better judge if you are uh, if you are llm so lastly with respect to judiciary that what would be that one advice you would like to give the judicial aspirants yeah, judicial aspirants, one advice, I think uh, generally they need to be very good at procedural law. And uh, from my own personal experience, what I have seen is that, uh, that a judicial service aspirant would be good in criminal law, even substantive and procedural aspect of it, uh, but not so much when it comes to the procedural aspects of civil law. So I think uh, my advice would be that if you were to actually uh, crack the examination, your focus obviously should be overall on whatever is part of the syllabus, but primarily your focus must lie on the procedural aspects of civil law. If you are good at that, I don't think uh, uh, you would not only clear the examination, you would be among the top bracket of the successful candidates. So coming to the next point, that's corporate sector, uh, favorite of many law students. So sir, uh, where should one line up oneself uh, for a corporate career? Line up, I think it's again based on your interest. I think if you are, uh, if you are somebody who, uh, who has the drive uh, to join the corporate world, uh, so far as the work ethic is concerned, I don't think uh, if you are into some, some other profession or career choice that you will have uh, lesser volume of work because the general perception is that if you are, uh, if you, if you opt for a career in corporate uh, side, then uh, you will hardly have time for personal life. But I don't think that's the right way to look at it because if you are doing any other work, uh, you are doing it seriously, obviously you will have difficulty finding uh, time for your own self. So therefore, it again for me, uh, it is the drive if you are, if you are the one who, has, who is actually passionate about uh, the field of business and corporate law in particular. Uh, then uh, obviously the corporate life is a very good option for you because if you get into uh, judicial, for example, judicial service, you will hardly have an opportunity to even have an interface with uh, business law or corporate law. So it's primarily about your drive. If you, if you have that drive, uh, then uh, definitely corporate field is also a very good career option uh, despite the fact that it is not uh, uh, celebrated so much by the High Court and Supreme Court judges that they would continuously tell the students of National Law University to also think of uh, to think of litigation as a career option. Uh, but I don't think uh, corporate field is a bad career choice, and I certainly do not underestimate a National Law School student who opts for a career in uh, corporate field. Okay. Sir, um, do you think like is it like sec corporate sec in corporate sector uh, the growth stabilizes? Like a lot of people uh, say that after eight to ten years there's no growth. You are at a stable point, and then you are waiting to get promoted or something like that because 
it has already been taken seven to eight years to come from associate to being a senior associate or like that. So do you also think that growth stabilizes in corporate sector? Okay. Uh, personally, I do not have the experience of uh, working in a corporate field. But uh, growth stabilizes, I, I don't, I again would probably not buy this argument. Uh, because uh, even uh, I recently had an interaction with one of my former students from uh, RML NLU Lucknow and she told me that she has become a partner now in a top law firm. So uh, I don't think that uh, it's the growth stabilization uh, stabilizes after a while and that there is no growth possible uh, once you are in corporate field. Say for example, if you have invested 10 years of your of your life there. In, in fact, some of my batchmates, I am a graduate of 2006. Even some of my batchmates are into the corporate field and I continuously see them grow. And growing is not only growing in one in one organization. If suppose uh, you have put in a considerable number of years in corporate field in an organization, if you think that uh, you are not growing in that organization, then the fact that you have experience, that experience will definitely come in handy for you to change the organization. And if you do that, certainly uh, the, the growth that you are looking for would automatically come along. Oh, sir. So coming to the next point, that is litigation, an interesting one for a lot of people. So sir, uh, firstly, how to be a successful litiga litigator? Like what according to you is litigation as a career choice? Yes, uh, litigation uh, is something where the national law school is generally accused of not contributing enough. Uh, yes, the <clears throat> probably uh, right, the, the statistically probably right. But then one has to look at the challenges which uh, uh, which a litigator would face. Uh, if without any family uh, backup, uh, you join litigation, then you have to survive uh, as a litigator for definitely for the first five years. And uh, how many of us uh, actually possess uh, that tenacity where we can actually uh, continue in litigation for five years uh, uh, without actually being able to uh, earn a sufficient amount of money uh, which will be sufficient for, for a family to live in a, uh, in, 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 a, in a capital city because generally high courts would be situated in, in, in capital cities. So that's why survival for the first five years, I guess, is the, is the, is the key. But if one could actually uh, see through that first five years phase, then I think uh, one can definitely not only survive, but excel in litigation. And the good thing with uh, five-year law school that I see is that the students, uh, when they graduate, they are 21, 22, 23. So therefore, they can invest the, the five next, next five years of their life in litigation while getting a little bit of support from their family while they are into this initial phase. So, so I guess, especially for students who are young, uh, who have graduated at a younger age, uh, I think litigation, uh, despite the fact that for first few years it will be hard, uh, they can take up that battle. And uh, as, as, as many, many of us uh, would be told, that once you, are, once you have crossed that phase, then probably uh, the struggle so far as meeting the ends meet is definitely not there. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a career option uh, worth uh, taking up, but yes, for initial years, you need to be ready for that, uh, for that period where probably you'll have to struggle. But then yes, it is very, uh, uh, one good thing about litigation is that uh, it is very fulfilling as a career choice and uh, even small uh, gains that you have as a litigator gives you immense satisfaction. So that is something which is, uh, which cannot be compared probably with uh, other professions. And uh, so coming to the next question that is, do you, do you need to do internships with uh, budding lawyers or rather with senior advocates if you want to learn intricacies of law? Because a lot of people say that if you go to a very famous or very known lawyer's chamber, you will not be able to learn intricacies of law. So to learn that, you should join a budding lawyer. But then again, the problem is when you'll go to uh, join the chamber of a very well-known person, people say that internships or your CV should have good internships. And budding lawyers, a lot of people don't know. So what do you suggest? To learn intricacies or doing litigating internships to make CV? 
I don't think making CVs should be the primary objective because uh, the primary objective of internship is to uh, is to make a student uh, aware about the practical aspects of law and therefore uh, yes automatically if you do an internship it adds to your CV but that should always be the secondary cause for which a student must be working for and the primary cause must remain to observe law in action and therefore I I don't think uh, it really ma it real it should really matter uh, whether you are doing an internship with a big lawyer or a or, or, or a budding lawyer uh, because what is important is that whether you have an eye whether you have an eye for observing how law operates in uh, in reality or not if that is what you have then I think regardless of the place regardless of the office that you're part of if you are a keen observer and if you can make those uh, finer distinctions between how at a theoretical level law is understood and how at a practical level it operates I think uh, what is expected from an internship, uh, you are successful in achieving that. So it's it's all boils down to, I guess, how good you are as an observer, as a student, who can see how, who can see as to how law operates in action. Okay, and sir, like many times it happens that if you want to join office of a renowned lawyer, like a senior advocate, it matters what your CV is. So if there's person X who has done a lot of internships, learn all the intricacies. But the CV does not hold any uh, known lawyer's internship as a baggage. So to join that particular office of a senior advocate, though he knows intricacies of the law, but since CV is not there, he may not get that opportunity which he's. Yes, but then uh, to, to think of that, uh, if you want to join litigation, you ought to have uh, joined a, a senior advocate once you have graduated. I don't think that's required. You don't need to. You don't need to start as a litigator from the office of a, a senior and a very well-known lawyer. You can start because uh, because when you are joining the field of litigation, your objective is not to continue in the office of a big senior advocate. You would eventually want to uh, have set up your own independent practice. So therefore, uh, I would not suggest that you should primarily look for a. Uh, big office uh, if you have to start your career as a litigator. So even if you do not have uh, big lawyers to boast of in terms of your internship, exper internship experience, uh, if you have, it's good. If you don't have, I don't think that there is a need for you to be disappointed just because of that. I'm hearing it. So, uh, so one more question that, do you believe that litigation is a career where you get hyped name and fame, but it takes 10 years for some? or rather say like you j just now you said that it takes time in, in initial years and then ultimately you cope up with that so do you believe that it takes it it always takes five to ten years or it's all about zeal like if for example i have taken 10 years if the another person is more zealous and more efficient he or she may get the same name of fame within two to three years can litigation yeah, i don't think you can theorize how theorize the you know, the average time which a litigator would take in order to become a successful lawyer. Yes, because uh, it, how so good, uh, howsoever good you may be, but the fact is that you need to get briefs. Okay, so and, and uh, in order to get briefs, uh, you need to be known as somebody who knows the art of lawyering. And uh, that is why uh, I don't think that you can fix a timeline uh, which a person must necessarily go through uh, before becoming successful. Yes, uh, some, uh, because yes, in a way luck also plays a part because, uh, because as I said, eventually you, you, you are able to take care of your life, your livelihood concerns because you are getting clients. So, and, and obviously your skill set is, is one reason why clients would come to you, but that is not the only reason. So therefore, uh, th to say that there is, a, there is an average timeline, I would not, I would not say that, but yes, uh, five years is something which ordinarily it, it, it takes for, for a person to, to be able to have uh, some grounding in litigation. So it may vary from for some person, 
uh, but then five years i don't think anyone can actually say that i have uh, i have acquired sufficient grounding in the field of litigation without having completed even five years of practice so coming to the very important points and of the very common question that everyone has the first generation lawyers they do have problems because they do not have backing of a lawyering background yes. so sir uh, what do you say like where to where a first generation lawyer should should start litigation like native place or preferring high courts or first native place and then moving to high courts and what would that advise from you yeah that's again i think uh, is something which uh, which cannot be uh, theorized in terms of uh, as to what is a uh, what is the correct approach because uh, i personally believe that uh, your personal life and your family also matters so therefore uh, if you can uh, if you, if you can work at your native place regardless of the fact that you do not have a high court there i don't see that that is uh, that is per se a wrong approach because uh, in contemporary times it is an extraordinary luxury uh, that uh, you go home every day to your family and if once you migrate uh, meeting your family also becomes a luxury so therefore if you can uh, work at your native place uh, where you can go to your family every day uh, i i i don't see that can be compared in monetary terms so that certainly Uh, is not something which should be easily discarded and uh, that, that's uh, yeah obviously if you work at a native if you are working at a native place where there is no high court so obviously in terms of remuneration in terms of fee that you can command as a lawyer uh, there obviously you'll have to make some compromises but like i said that going to your family uh, every evening is something that you cannot compare with uh, uh, in, in monetary terms so that's that's one uh, which i think uh, should be should always be kept in mind and should also should always be kept separate uh a high court and supreme court yes there are different skill sets also required uh but especially because you invest and you are a first generation lawyer and you would be investing first few years uh to undergo that hard time where uh, where the litigation as a profession would make you think as to whether you have opted for a correct career choice or not i think keeping that in mind uh, it is not uh, wrong for a person to think that okay in the initial years if i have struggled uh, by the time i have sufficient grounding in in the field i must be able to compensate for those hard times if that is what uh, one has set he is a her objective uh, then i guess uh, high court and supreme court is certainly uh, a better option because uh, at district court regardless of the fact that you may be very good at uh, you may have extraordinary skill set but then uh, there is a limit to what you can earn there and that's why if uh, if one is actually investing uh, the initial hard hard period in in litigation then uh, certainly uh, start high court and and supreme court even gradual migration there is a very good career option is is a very good and wise career choice okay so coming to the most interesting part academia so sir what was that one driving factor that drove you towards academia and not litigation not judiciary okay there are two things one uh, that uh, uh, after uh, llb I, i i took admission in llm and uh, then i was not uh, very sure as to what i want to do uh, i i thought that i should study a little more and that's why i took admission in llm uh, but while i was doing uh, llm uh, i i did my llm from the indian law institute and there uh, uh, most of my professors uh, wanted that uh, that we should uh, become teachers and uh, seeing them uh, and that's that certainly uh, also inspired me that uh, i can also be like them so i i think while studying while doing my llm i decided that i i can be a teacher uh, but then also i th- i think i was lucky because uh, immediately after doing my llm i had the opportunity to appear for a faculty interview at uh, 
RMLNLU Lucknow. And uh, a month after completing my LLM, I was taking classes in BLLB honors course at, at, at RMLNLU. So I think this, this, op this opportunity that I got uh, to work at RML also helped me in a way uh, to bolster my belief that I can be, uh, I can, I, I can think of academia as a as a career yes. choice, and yes, once I once I was into it, I therefore I thereafter I never thought of uh, anything else. But uh, to say that right from the beginning I was driven by uh, the cause of academia, I think I think I'd be lying. Uh, yes, while doing LLM, I looking at my teachers and the fact that they wanted us to become teachers, it definitely became a very strong. Uh, choice in my mind and the opportunity that I got immediately after my LLM uh, paved the way in a way for me to become a teacher. Okay. So sir, now since you are a professor, so what all perks do you think uh, academia has as compared to judiciary or litigation or any other legal career opportunity for that matter? Well, first of all, I'm not a professor, I'm an, I'm an associate professor. Uh, <coughs> so, but I, I think it would be uh, unreasonable to compare the perks of uh, uh, perks of a, of somebody who is a teacher from that of a litigator because uh, in in litigation you don't get, you're not paid salary, okay? And uh, you would know that uh, there are advocates in India who would charge uh, in lakhs for one single appearance. So therefore, there's no comparison if you start comparing. You know, top lawyers, what they charge, and what uh, somebody who is in, uh, in in a in a salaried job would get. So I think the comparison should be between uh, salaried jobs. So I guess if you are, uh, say for example, if you compare it with somebody who is into judicial service, then obviously uh, the the one who is in judicial service in the initial stage is paid more compared to what an assistant professor would get. The judicial magistrate would get more. Uh, but then gradually as, a, as, a, as you move up the ladder, even in academia, then, uh, then after I think seven, eight years, uh, the, the salary structure is, is almost at par with what a judicial officer would be getting. So that way, I guess you make up for the initial loss if you are into academia compared to a judicial officer. And uh, in private sector, again, I don't think uh, the comparison would be wise because uh, in corporate field, again, depending upon the, the law firm or the corporate uh, world that you are part of, uh, the salary structure varies. Uh, but yes, uh, in, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, whether uh, academia is sufficiently remunerative or not, yes, the answer is certainly yes. Uh, you are paid sufficient uh, salary that you can, even if your spouse or is not working, you can take care of your family if you are an assistant professor also. Uh, but the second thing obviously is to get to become a regular assistant professor is, is problematic because uh, there are not many options available. And that's why uh, not everyone who is an assistant professor would actually be getting the salary which an assistant professor should otherwise get as per University Grants Commission. So when I'm talking about the perks of an assistant professor, I am assuming that an assistant professor is getting what University Grants Commission expects an assist assistant professor to get. Because uh, as you would know, uh, uh, that an assistant professor would even be getting half of what an assistant professor should ordinarily get. So I'm talking about the perks which are at par with what the UGC expects an assistant professor to get. But that is not the reality everywhere. So, sir, uh, how should one initiate if one wants to enter in academia, like writing research papers, articles, how much these things matter, like if you want to guide a person? Yes, obviously, uh, <clears throat> now uh, the competition, even at the entry level, uh, is, is there. It, has bec it is becoming uh, tougher uh, day by day, and that's why even from an entry level, even for an entry level position, uh, one would expect that that there is some academic orientation, evidence of some academic orientation must be there. So what your research does is that it exhibits that you possess that academic orientation, uh, which uh, a person would be looking, uh, looking for a, in a person who aspires to become uh, a teacher in law. 
and that's why for that purpose uh, papers are required but then again if you if you write a paper with a view that that it will help you get a job then i don't don't think the quality of paper would be uh, would would certainly be uh, be better or good so what is important is that 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 again ac academia is also you need to have that drive otherwise it's hard to sustain there because uh, because apart from uh, because the because the, what what is the high that you get you when you are a teacher a simple praise from a student that sir uh, really, uh, yeah really taught well for 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 many of us in this materialistic world uh, this is definitely not sufficient uh, to be even be recognized as as a high and and that's why uh, to to survive and to to be able to sustain yourself in academia you need to have that drive you need to have that academic orientation which is uh, which must be inherent so therefore if that is there then you would automatically write papers yes but the reality is that in 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 modern times in contemporary times even at the entry level uh, one is expected to have at least a few papers and that's why if one is uh, looking at academia as a career choice then definitely uh, uh, published papers uh, are of are of help but then don't write papers because papers are going to help you become teacher yes. write papers because you have that drive where you want to convey a thought that you have that has crossed your mind so you need to identify whether you have that drive or not uh, because otherwise it's uh, to to invest 30 years or 35 years of your life in academia would be would be hard and that's why it's very important to recognize whether you have that orientation or not right okay right. so uh, coming to next few options like upsc a lot of aspirants uh, like even after opting for law a lot of people take quality as subject so like being uh, being a law aspirant uh, how would like you see taking law as an option optional paper in upsc okay again i do not have uh, the experience but then i have spoken to uh, a few of my students who have cleared uh, upsc with law optional and even they tell me that uh, with law uh because the syllabus uh, their feedback is that the syllabus becomes quite vast, vast. and that is why uh they they have uh seen law students uh not keeping law as an optional yeah. but then uh, somehow my experience is that uh, uh not many of my students are into upsc but yes five six of them i can recall uh and one is fortunately adm jabalpur presently and you know, adm jabalpur is also a very famous name but uh, one of my students from rml uh, she is adm jabalpur presently misha singh uh, and and she has cleared uh, upsc with uh, law optional and few of my other students also who are into ias uh, they have also cleared it from uh, with law optional so they tell me that uh, yes it is vast but the fact that i have invested 5 years of my life into getting a degree of ba llb honors to start studying a subject from scratch and to master it i guess if you have if i have studied a subject for 5 years regardless of the fact that the syllabus is is slightly uh, more compared to uh, another subjects uh, but then uh, the fact that i put in those 5 years i would be more confident in keeping law as an optional rather than take an entirely new subject as an optional and start reading that subject from scratch and i think that's a that's a that's a wise uh, 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 advice to give if i have invested 5 years in my of my life into studying law then i guess it makes sense regardless of the syllabus uh, that i opt for law as an optional for my upsc exams also so uh, coming to next point that is ngos so like how do you think that it the like, career option for a law aspirant be there when it yeah. comes to ngos yes i think ngo and career option the, the two uh, may not go uh, you know hand in hand. Uh, yeah hand in hand because uh, uh, ngo work it would require a very different kind of drive because if you are working in an ngo then you are definitely not the one who is looking to make money so so that's a very different kind of drive uh if you want to work with an ngo obviously these days uh, uh, even uh, so some good ngos uh one may be paid well 
But again, the drive is not the salary and the perks. So the drive has to be to, uh, to make that difference to the cause uh, that you are invested primarily in. And that's why if you have that drive, uh, I have come across students who, who, who were very good uh, in their law schools and they have by choice opted for uh, uh, a career in NGO. Yes. But then that's primarily because they, they, would, they are interested in becoming what is called cause lawyering. And uh, they say that cause lawyering is something which I can, uh, I can put my skills into use if I get into an NGO. And, uh, and that's why they have, they have gotten into NGOs primarily. But yes, that drive is, that requires a, a entirely different skill set if one wants to have a career in NGO. Because you don't make a career in NGO, you actually invest uh, your, your life in a way to a cause that you think is very dear to you and you believe that, that your presence for that cause would make a difference to that cause. Sir, uh, coming to the point of Vidhi Think Tank, every law school has this uh, discussion to join Vidhi Think Tank for research purposes and everything. So, how can it be a good option for career? Yeah, Vidhi Center for Legal Policy is not the only think tank, but yes, it's a very prominent one. Uh, and again, if, uh, if one is interested in research, that's a very good option because uh, in India generally what is, uh, what is believed is that if you are interested in research, uh, you have to be uh, a teacher because only a teacher would do research. research. Okay. Gradually in, 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 in the contemporary times, we are seeing that uh, litigating lawyers uh, are also exceptionally good researchers. You know, like Abhinav Chandrachud would come up with a book probably every year. And he is one of the most uh, busy litigators at Bombay High Court. And yet you will find him that every year a book of Abhinav Chandrachur would come. Like in Bangalore, Harish Narasappa is a very respected advocate. And he has started Daksh Foundation, which is a research organization. And they are doing exceptionally good research work. So uh, that's a good thing that has uh, off late started. That uh, research in a way has got uh, delinked with academia to the extent that you don't necessarily need to be a teacher if you want to be a researcher. Right. And that's why think tanks also are very good career to options where uh, you can, the only job that you do is to, is to research and you are paid well in return for the job that you do. And therefore, yes, uh, research, uh, a career in research is also a very good option. And career in research where you don't necessarily end up becoming a teacher is a good career option. And for that, think tank is is definitely a, a, a very good option. Okay. Sir, so, uh, coming to next point, that is international organizations. Like ICJ also offers fellowships. Yes. So, how far is that a good option to choose? Yeah, fellowships would be temporary. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, if you get a fellowship, obviously it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, law is, uh, is, is such a discipline where uh, international organizations would always look at a law graduate as, as, as somebody whom they would like to recruit. Uh, obviously not every law graduate, but law is because of, because of the interdisciplinarity which is associated with law. Uh, international organizations also would always be keen to recruit law students. Uh, but yes, uh, if uh, international organizations uh, would generally perhaps not be happy with uh, a BA, LLB honors degree. So they would look for, uh, uh, look for uh, stu uh, prospective uh, st uh, candidates who have uh, gone for higher education. And that's why if one is interested in, in, in joining international organizations, then my recommendation would be that they should definitely go for LLM. And if you are seriously considering uh, working in top international organizations like World Bank, uh, International Monetary Fund, uh, then you should uh, uh, think of doing LLM from, uh, from abroad, uh, preferably from UK or USA, because uh, some of my students who work with uh, World Bank, like I know two of my students who are working with World Bank, uh, they have done their uh, masters from uh, USA. So uh, that is one thing which I have found is, is, is a common thing 
uh, among students uh, who are presently working with international organizations. So I guess that definitely helps the cause if you are interested uh, in joining international organizations. So what are your thoughts on international lawyering? Yeah, international, uh, international lawyers, uh, you know, this is also, <clears throat> uh, I, I, when I talk about international lawyers, I would uh, categorize them into two, one who are international law lawyers and one who are international lawyers. So international lawyers, one who is practicing law outside India. Uh, so you can be a litigator, you can be uh, working with a law firm. Uh, but yes, international, they are called international lawyers. And uh, again, National Law School has uh, exposed the students, uh, or law students in India with this career option also that they can study in India and work at, work at London. And uh, despite the fact that they may not have studied uh, UK laws in their law school, but the fact that they have the skill set required to be, uh, to be able to comprehend uh, the nuances and technicalities associated with law. So that makes them uh, good enough even in order to handle uh, matters and cases where they would only be dealing with uh, UK laws. And that's something which, in, which the credit entirely goes to the, to the phenomenon of the movement of the National Law School. So international law definitely is, uh, sorry, international lawyering is definitely one uh, career choice. The second is international law lawyering. Uh, that again is a very niche career career option and a very difficult one because uh, because even I, I i i i know a very few from india who are who have invested entirely uh, into uh, into international law lawyering but yes if you are primarily interested in international law and if you can put in a little more uh, little extra yards like a BLLB honors degree probably would not suffice if you wish to become an international law lawyer so because they would be looking at somebody who is PhD probably uh, but then uh, if you have that drive for international law public international law in particular then international law lawyering is also uh, a career choice uh, uh, which obviously is worthy and rewarding. But yes, you need to have that drive for international law in particular. And uh, also you need to be, you need to have that requisite that is required to you for you to sustain you a little more into studies because that requires uh, you to have, uh, uh, have higher education is something which is, which is a must for uh, higher education beyond BLLB honors. I think would be a must for you to uh, excel in international law. So, uh, PSUs. So, CLAT PG is one way to enter PSUs. So, what's the scope of career in PSUs and what else if not CLAT PG? Yeah, CLAT PG these days uh, has become the route to enter uh, public sector undertakings. Uh, but I, I guess pub, uh, public sector undertakings are free to hold their own uh, recruitment exams, just that they find it convenient that without holding an examination, they're able to shortlist candidates and interview them. So that's why they opt for the CLAT PG uh, mechanism. Uh, yes, but in terms, of, in terms of job, it is definitely very rewarding. Uh, the students, my, some of my students who are into PSUs, they tell me that the salary and the perk is very good. But one common feedback that I've got is that, that the work is not very challenging uh, in the sense that uh, you, you, you do not have uh, uh, the volume of work uh, is first of all, the volume of work is not that much and, uh, and the kind of work that you get is quite routine. So that's one feedback that I've got from, from them and, and I've even uh, recently one of my very good students, he, he resigned from a public sector undertaking after working for four years and he has uh, uh, decided to enter litigation. So yes, I'm not saying PSU is a bad career choice. And definitely in terms of salary and perks, it is very rewarding. Uh, but yes, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the quality and the quantity of work that you get, the feedback that I've got from, student, from my students is that it is not very challenging and hence not very exciting. Okay. So it's the last question that, what are your views on a law student not opting law as a career? Yes, I think uh, uh, we need to realize that uh, uh, BA, LLB honors or LLB is also a graduate degree. So, and, and a graduate 
for a graduate, there are so many options available. Because graduation, obviously graduation in law gives you that uh, specialization. But uh, we must accept the fact that after all, BA, LLB or LLB is also a graduation degree. And that's why there are many options which are available to a graduate. I think same way those options are also available for law graduates. And, uh, and that's why uh, opting for a career which is not related with law, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine. And I think also, uh, like, some may be interested in music, some may be interested in writing. So that is perfectly fine. Like, if you have that drive, uh, I don't think uh, we should uh, overburden a student with expectations just because uh, he or she has opted to study law that he must not pursue his uh, uh, his passion. Like one of my batchmates, uh, he was into a public sector undertaking. Uh, he has resigned and uh, he is a very famous uh, Hindi uh, novelist now. Uh, and on one of his uh, novels, uh, 84, there is a web series that was recently made and it was very, uh, you know, it was, it became very popular. He has become a celebrity uh, or, uh, because of his skill as a, as a Hindi novelist. And he was a very good law student, but then he decided that uh, probably uh, novel, Hindi novel writing is his calling. And that's why he decided to resign from a public sector undertaking job. And he is full time into writing novels these days. So that's why I think that's important. Person, uh, first of all, realize what is his or her actual calling. And if that is the drive which that person has, then we must not uh, overburden uh, that student uh, with our expectation that if you are a law graduate, uh, you must do something in life which has necessarily got to do with law. I think we need to get rid of this, uh, this uh, presupposition that we would attach to every law student. So lastly, since the area of discussion was legal career opportunities, so what would you suggest one should identify that one driving factor, one efficiency that everyone has in himself or herself, but just to identify that so that you can drive towards the thing that you ultimately want to get in life. So yeah, it's a very difficult question. Because uh, the reality is that uh, uh, India, the population of India, uh, compared to the job option that, that you have, are very limited. So I think I, I would not give a very uh, you know, pedantic or theoretical answer to this question. The, the reality is that you need to earn your livelihood. Yes, if you, if you get something where, uh, where you can uh, channel your energy and your inclination uh, into what you are actually doing for your livelihood, that would be better. But I think even if you have got an opportunity, not necessarily because you were driven to do that, uh, that thing, but if you have got that opportunity, I think you can, you, you can make a life out of it. Uh, what is important is that you need to be uh, always a good student of law. And if you are a good student of law, regardless of what profession uh, you are part of uh, in terms of op career options in law, if you have that uh, humility of acknowledging that you are eventually a student, uh, then I guess uh, you will eventually excel in your life. Thank you, sir, for taking out your precious time to guide students. And I hope this will be helpful for a lot of many. Thank you, Gauri. Thank you.